Welcome. Welcome again to the uh, conference. Sunday, the uh, a third day of the conference and, and the final day. Um, those of you who need to uh, fly to the airport, fly to the, uh, go to the airport in order to fly, uh, then uh, perhaps uh, uh, if, you, if you want to share a trip or whatever, talk to the reception desk and we'll try and organise, bring people together who are travelling around the same time. That'd be a good idea, you know, either this afternoon or, or, or tomorrow or whenever it is. If you're returning, we'll sort something out. Because we know transport in London is very complicated, like everything else here. Um, okay, so uh, this morning we're going to talk about um, uh, chess and education. And we're going to talk about the um, uh, issues such as uh, uh, qualifications and accreditation. So this is uh, trying to... Uh, really formalize the type of professional activity that we've been engaged with, you know, to what extent can we actually set standards, uh, to what extent can we um, uh, instruct uh, teachers in what they should be doing in class of them. And, uh, you know, briefly, I, I would say that there's uh, the usual um, uh, W question. So, so, you know, why, why are we doing this? Why do we want chess and schools, but if we, if we knew why we wanted chess and schools, then we could kind of work back from that. Um, then uh, we'd say, well, if we want chess and schools, who are we targeting? Is it all children? Is it just the talented children? Is it just the children with special needs? You know, who is it that we're, we're really targeting here? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> then we'd say, um, well, what, what therefore uh, should we teach? Should we be teaching uh, chess? Should we be teaching mini games, strategy games, logic, critical thinking? You know, what is it that we should be we should be uh, teaching actually? And then, of course, the other big question, which probably takes the most time, is how should we teach? You know, what methods, what pedagogy, the didactics of teaching in the classroom? What technology should we use? Uh, how do we organize the classroom? What about discipline? What about social and intellectual development of the children? So, so many issues there. So, um, we're grappling with this sort of thing all the time. So, what I thought we would do this morning is bring together some of those people who are actively involved in education and in uh, giving training courses. So, these are the um, some leading trainers, both at the European Chess Union. And in Chile, so I have to be So um, I'd like, first of all, then, to, to introduce um, Boris Boone, who's, who's already spoken about technology at the, at the conference. And Boris is going to give us um, a, a brief overview of what the, the issues are. And then I will, um, I will invite each of the other <laughs> speakers to uh, give, a, give a perspective. And then we'll have an open debate. Does that sound good? Thank okay. you. Okay, good. So, Boris. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, young, smart, uh, smart English guy. And he sent me only two questions of the 10, so I can only start with the <laughs> one question of these. Um, so, as you can see, I was asked uh, what teacher training and accreditation is about. So um, if you ask me as a person, and uh, if you allow me, I will stand up to stand next to the screen like yesterday. Um, it is important that a teacher, uh, uh, that a course provides the basic rules of chess. Okay, obviously. Um, then pedagogical methods and activities, which is in our case, mini games. Um, the most important thing, the gamification method is very important to a teacher. Um, then problem solving skills, so the games must be a little bit more complicated if possible. Um, then as well as fair play and responsibility. Yeah? So fair play means we have uh, something like a classroom contract. Yeah? Set up the board after you played something very useful uh, to see if all the pieces are still there. Something like this. Um, and besides all of this, they should have fun. And not only the kids on the courses. Also, it is very important to have a little bit of fun on the teacher training course because if we want to provide this for the kids, um, the teachers should have it too. Um, 
Um, and how to do this? Uh, we need a, a, lot, a lot of tools to give them a hand that they can use for, for classroom teaching. Uh, a lot of mini games, methods, um, talking about uh, even or odd numbers of participants in the classroom. Yeah, you need solutions for this one too. And um, you, they should have a maximum amount of freedom. Yeah, that they can say, I'm sorry, the same problem like yesterday. Um, uh, that they they can they can have this toolkit and they can decide what fits best to their classroom. Yeah, because they know the kids. I don't know all of them, but uh, as long as they have a lot of tools that they can choose from and they have the freedom to choose, it's a good course. Yeah, and they have a, a, a plan how to teach what um, in, in uh, at what time. So uh, they have to change the social forms. Sometimes they have to work on their own. Yeah, individual work is important. Working in pairs, working in groups, um, and uh, the different methods we were talking about. I don't know. Um, then it's called the disco duel or invention of mind, something like this. Yeah. So um, to have a practical example, click. <coughs> uh, one of these methods is the mirror technique, which is very important to teachers who are not familiar with uh, all the rules of chess. Yeah? They don't feel safe in their environment. If they feel anxious to teach chess. Uh, I give this as a method. So uh, if a child comes to me and asks, uh, is it checkmate? Uh, it's not a good advice to say, yes, for example, or no. It's much better to, uh, to say, tell me, please tell me. Yeah? What do you have to check? Yeah. Uh, why is it checkmate, or why is it, 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 it's, it's not? So to mirror the question back is one of these examples. This should be a part of a teacher training course that uh, they always remember. And repetition is unbelievable important. Yeah. Uh, normally teachers feel the obligation to give the right answer straight away. Yeah. Uh, that's that's pretty normal to them. Yeah. Because they need to be informed. Uh, they know know what to talk about. And uh, but this in this moment they, they have to follow a guideline, a questionnaire. Yeah. So is this check first of all rule number zero, and then there is nothing that can be done against check. So this is thinking. This means the king has no move. Uh, the the um, piece that is given the check cannot be captured, and there is no piece that can in between go in between. So this is the guideline, and then that's done. So this is my impression. I was asked to talk about this. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Boris. Um, Boris has run many, many courses uh, in, in, in the German-speaking community, and uh, uh, we always get excellent feedback from those who attend the course. We know Boris is one of the leading uh, trainers in, in Europe. OK, now, uh, and so Laubscher Lau from uh, South Africa to give us uh, another perspective on uh, the teaching of chess and in how do you think we should approach it and what sort of qualifications may be relevant. And so, how do you? Um, you I'll, stand up. I'll stand up. Um, I, I didn't prepare a PowerPoint, uh, but um, I'll give you a little bit of background on, on my experience in this. So when we when they started the, the online training for lecturers in, I think it was 2020 or 2021, I can't remember now, uh, I was part of the pilot group. So I did the first, the first round of, of qualification for, for preparation of teacher's course, the lecturer's part, um, or lead instructor, as I call it now. And um, it was done online, and I found it very interesting, and, and it, it was amazing. But then I also realized, so as you know, I'm from South Africa, and I'm very much involved and in touch with what happens in Africa as a whole. And I, I still play actively as well, so I travel a lot, and, I, and I, whenever I get to certain countries, I will often do a similar with the kids or something, get involved, and not only play. And I realized that this is this is amazing the online the online course, but it might not be suitable for Africa because it teaches amazing skills. But in Africa, sometimes we're still running around to find a white chalk to write on a blackboard, um, where other countries have a white interactive smart board, you know. 
And I then proposed, or I took the initiative to say, let's do this in person. Um, once we had a little bit of, of leeway with, with COVID in December 2021, I went to Kenya and uh, presented this at um, the African Schools Championship. So there were people from all over Africa coming with their junior players. And I presented to 74. I had a co-presenter, Robert Katenda from Queen of Katwe. I'm not sure if you, if you recall that name. Yeah, I think everyone knows Robert. So we had so much fun and it was amazing to have it in person. And since then it's been booming in Africa. And the African countries all want it and even the rest of the world now. So we, we're taking it both ways. The online part of preparation of teachers course, we, we revised the entire, the entire course and we will have our first course revised <coughs> course on the 14th of, of April that weekend. And the course is already filled up. We have a waiting list. And as soon as the waiting list is filled up, we will schedule the next, the next online course. So the online is running fantastically. And, and now we're also taking it back to the, to the basic board. The, the in-person training as well. So that's that's my experience in this for so so far. Great, thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, Pep Suarez from uh, Spain, and Pep is teaching in the Spanish language not only in Spain but also in. Latin America. So I would invite, uh, and we've seen uh, Pep give a presentation of uh, a software platform yesterday, which is really fascinating. Uh, Pep, would you like to just give some some observations on teaching and qualifications? Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> well, <coughs> can I just say, if you stood in the middle, you in the middle. I always put the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, I think we must define and clarify what is just for education. I think in this is a question that we don't have any answer until now. And this is a problem, I think, big problem. And I think in that field, ECO and the other federation must clarify what is just for education. Many years ago, I remember maybe 20, 22 years ago in the first Congress that we're doing in in Menorca, uh, with the people around the world. <laughs> we want to, 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 to know how in the school working chess. But now we're thinking that we all, all know exactly what must we do, but we didn't. First of all, for me, chess in the school is a tool for education. So, it is a tool for education in primary school. We don't need to use chess to teach chess. And everybody, among all the people, a lot of people, uh, when they uh, show the curriculum, just show chess make games. I think in, this is a wrong way. I think it is a wrong way. Because in primary school, you can use for another, another competitive, another skills, like take decisions, like empathy like socialization, like motivation, like to feel the success. And I think in chess is a the perfect way. After this, of course, the, you got the answer, who must teach chess in the primary school? The teachers. The teacher. And of course, we can teach the teacher in the correct way. Uh, you know, for example, I like it so much, Smart method with the 101. Or what can we do in Balearics Island that we for we training the teachers just in education? They we give the <coughs> resource resource that they can use in the school, but not for uh, the for teaching chess. Uh, no, because and you know very well if you learn you teach music at the primary school, you don't teach. The canon panel ball. You just teach the remi, the remi, the mi fa sol, and it's that all that they need. The other people, when they want to learn more, is outside of the school. 
you got the crafts, you got the associations, you got everything. So for me, it's very important to clarify this, that the stairs for education and the primary school is just a tool to integrate another activities. And the teacher must be, must be the people who teach us. And of course, the people who are working this way can help this teacher to use and define what is the best method of different methods to this chess. It's not in the same way that you stay teaching three, four, five years. Maybe you can use energy as a skill. Maybe you can use a Diana Salazar method. I don't know. If you stay in six, seven, eight years, maybe you can play with many games. You can play with another kind of different creative uh, elements. <clears throat> but what happened? And this is the end. I know that it's difficult to make a lot of resources to the teacher from five or six years until 11, 12. Because you start with a core, you play something, and what I do with the next year? Huh? I don't know. Okay, I start with the openings. I start with the key. For me, this is a wrong way. I think. That's all. Thank you. So, um, great. That, uh, I think um, puts a cat amongst the pigeons uh, in the sense that uh, we're saying that maybe in primary school we shouldn't be trying to teach chess, but maybe focus on mini games and other activities which are chess related, but not expecting kind of the full game of chess. Um, the final panelist is uh, Philip Bokovic, uh, who is from Belgium and uh, teaches chess and languages and is also the editor of the uh, ECU education magazine and um, has run many courses for uh, teachers in chess. So, Philippe, uh, over to you. Good morning. In fact, I fully agree with my colleagues here. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, my experience is that we traveled a long way already and um, let's say seven eight years ago we were convinced that introducing the game was enough to develop all those skills uh, for the children we only had to put a chessboard and they would develop their um, um, seven or um, multiple uh, intelligence mm -hmm. from from guard but now, um, during this weekend, I heard that we are not so convinced that it's, it goes automatically. We need, and um, Jerry said it yesterday, to deliberate, make choices to what goals do we want to achieve with chess in schools. And therefore, I believe that uh, a course for um, teaching in school should have three elements. First of all, we want a good teachers. Um, the good news is that all good teachers are certified. The bad news is that all bad teachers were also certified. <laughs> Does this can be a problem? Um, we have to foresee a kind of follow up. If the teacher who has his degree is still working with uh, the skills we expect from a teacher, that is motivational um, skills, and motivation goes by uh, psychology and communication, and a teacher also has to be able to manage his class. Um, so he needs more um, skills like differentiation, variation, cooperation. So that's, in my opinion, a first component of a chess school, a course for teachers, but also for trainers. Because we forget, and I have some troubles uh, in Belgium, making clear that those skills need to be um, um, acquired by coaches as well. They say you and your uh, your chess in schools, we don't see the number of members increase in the clubs. 
So if we help you and if we give chessboards to schools, we want, in fact, a return on investment. And we don't get it. But at some point, in my own club, um, the youth responsible was very happy to tell that there was an increase and that we had 15 new youth members. And when I look, looked at the numbers, the previous year, we had 42 children. And this year, we had 45. So I was asking him, 42 plus 15, he said 45. But no, Philip, did you know children go away because chess is not what they like to do? But then I say, well, why did they come to the chess club? And the problem in chess clubs is that you don't have people with the right skills to teach. So I believe that this component must be very uh, integrated in any course, be it competitive chess or chess in schools. Where chess in schools is concerned, you can say, okay, the teachers have their degree, so they can get an exemption for this part. Second part is chess. Of course, you expect a chess teacher to know what chess is. I, I wouldn't entrust um, a swim teacher who cannot swim and who tries to explain to my children how they have to swim. So this is a part where chess federations are very important because if one is a member of a chess federation, plays competitions, he knows what chess is. So you can give uh, an exemption for this part for um, chess players. And there is a third part that is very important for chess in schools. That is this awareness of what we can achieve with children through chess. For me, of course, it's in the first place com communication. But this doesn't go automatically. We have to be aware of what we want to do. And as Boris explained, the mirror a method by asking the children to explain themselves, make them more communicative. So this aspect has to be thought in a course as well. So that each teacher or maybe a coach entering the school is aware of. There we have a lot of work to do because primary school is not secondary school and pre-garden has other objectives to, to achieve. But we're just at a start. We have a lot of work to do, but I'm very optimistic that this is the right way to, to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've heard from all of you panelists now. I thought we'd just throw the floor open. Um, if somebody would like to ask a question, um, I can see a question from Chris Fegan, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Chesapeake Schools and Communities. Um, we don't have a handheld microphone, so if you just speak up. Alexis, or even, Alexis you definitely need to the front. Ah, uh, right. We even come to the front. That'd be my wonderful teacher. <laughs> One sick villain today, John. Uh, um, Chris supports Manchester City. He's a very self satisfied man now. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, first, that was a wonderful session, so thank you for everyone. Um, and for Chester and schools and communities, this is an absolutely critical uh, piece of work um, regarding chess teachers, chess trainers, and accrediting them. and and getting them ready to, to do the job for us in our schools. Uh, and for John, just thank you for getting me up at this time in the morning to come here. We put it on deliberately, so we had to get up early on a Sunday morning. So thank you for that. Um, but it's a wonderful session. But I did have one question, if I may, regarding your presentation. I think it was a previous slide. You talk about changing social forms. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Okay, social forms means uh, to me, okay, I just stand up means to me when, I, when I'm talking about social forms, we're talking about uh, the panel, the whole panel, or uh, pairs, working in pairs, working individually. Right. So that's the social form, uh, working 
yeah, having a, a, a chess session with all the worksheets and, and paper and having mini games and pairs, uh, having a game with three people. Yeah, you remember the curtain rings, uh, one of my inventions. So uh, that you can have different social forms means you have to deal with yourself or with other people. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Because that was, this is for us one of the most important parts of our work is getting people ready to go into the classroom setting or the after school setting or whatever setting it is because without the right teachers and trainers the children or the other people we're trying to train have little, little chance so we need to get this right and we put a lot of time and effort in so i'm very pleased um for this session so thank you thank you <laughs> okay would somebody else like to ask a question about okay oh right we yeah. have uh, uh, Matt, I, uh, also from Jetson School. Yes, we're not going to take over the session, but uh, thank you for that. It's very interesting. Uh, your comments are very interesting. Uh, I, I was very interested in what you were saying about as the, class, the classroom management side of things and how you can't deliver any chess uh, teaching without being able to properly control the classroom of children, whether it's six children or, or 30 children. And I just wonder how you build that into a, a sort of chess training course or chess training program when it's not something that we perhaps as chess players and as chess trainers are that experienced in. It's really, that's really sort of the teacher training side of thing. It's something that teachers training for for full year, certainly in the UK. How you build that in? Because I think it's absolutely critical that, that tutors, parents, whoever you're, you're training can go into the classroom and properly deliver the course. So were you directing that? Um, um, well, then, yes. when it talks about well, it's the general question, how you build this in this program? I believe we need a cooperation with ministries of education because um, they give the accreditation for uh, teachers. And I can imagine that you can follow a course with only pedagogy. And uh, what is very important is internship as well. But of course, it has a cost but it will increase uh, the quality of the courses. And it, I believe that not only chess teachers want to do teaching classes, need those skills. Um, there can be a yoga teacher um, wanting to, to enter the school and so on. So that Ministry of Education provide a kind of sign of quality um, after those people follow the course course that is quite intense. So not a sort of full teaching degree, but a mini course on a mini course on class management and motivation and responsibility. Because when you are in front of children, you must be aware of that, that you have a very important influence on, on the children. That would be a fantastic solution. It's not something we have in the UK, but it would be a fantastic solution if that was possible. I believe we have to work on it and, and try to, to find connections with ministries of education. And yes, I believe that if we want to make progress, we have to do it that way. But maybe I'm wrong. Yes. Um, um, I, I just like to, no, I just like to add to that, to that um, answer. Um, we, like I mentioned earlier, we revised the entire preparation of teacher schools and we included quite a lot of, of and even in the in the face-to-face -face delivery as well, we include quite a lot of teaching tips, like we call it, or classroom tips. And um, and I found with, with deliveries I gave so far is that many of the teachers, some of them have been teaching for 30, 40 years, would come to me afterwards and say, I never thought about it that way, and I can use it in all my subjects. So we need to understand that chess can also be used as a tool for a failing education system. And this is what we're trying to do as well. That um, often, uh, teach, we, we need to understand that it's not only teaching chess to the kids, but it's also empowering our educators. And when we speak to departments of education, for instance, we have to emphasize the fact that we are also empowering your employees we're giving them a new skill it's like a new subject to teach and in the past we look at this in a, in, in the wrong way we were waiting for little jane at the top to receive the trophy on the stage for little sarah to see oh i also want to have that one day and then start playing chess but now if every child is being introduced chess at let's say grade one for instance 
um, with these methods, because with chess comes certain things like discipline and concentration and all those things that are being passed to the students anyway, which which also such or, or, or support certain certain behavior in class. And once we understand that if every child that learns mathematics in grade one does not become become a mathematician, as my mm -hmm. colleagues know, the same is true. It doesn't mean that every child needs to play chess for the rest of their lives. But they are being introduced to it. And now once they go to 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 after school activities and they have to choose between soccer, um or about the another okay. soccer and, and chess, for instance, they will say, oh, I, I learned chess one, once before, so I, I think I'll try this. And that again feeds into your clubs and your and your coaches. So so coaches who complain that that um which the teachers are taking their work away, no. They're actually sending them more work. But you have to understand just to to just to summarize that chess brings other um, skills with it that might address those classroom yeah. issues. Yeah. Benton, uh, so uh, I think Tiago, you had a question. Yeah, uh, so you know where to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I'm all behind. Um, so actually, for the for the full full um, board, or um, so you you many points you are making for chess could be used for any other game as well. And there are specific games, and especially if I think of South Africa, there there will be interesting with the African chess uh, like Bao or Nchuva or other games which are also very interesting from from multiple perspectives which have similar approaches so addressing the elephant in the room how does chess stand out as opposed to other i mean for us in a cultural setting this makes a lot of sense because you know chess is is the erudite game by election in in, in europe and and uh, um, parts of asia but why not other games and how does chess compare or compete with those games in an educational setting. So how does chess compete against Go or Waichi or against the uh, Mancal family in other settings? So, yeah. Nobody stands up to answer that question. No, no. Um, <laughs> Well, um, I mean, certainly there are um, uh, cultural affinities uh, within within Europe for for what we call kind of um, international chess, and the, the the chess that's um, uh, promoted by FIDE, the International Chess uh, Federation. Um, there, but each continent has evolved its own its own forms of, of chess, as as you point out, Japan has its own. Of shogi and uh, China has its own form, and um, and then there are other uh, kind of apex games such as Go, uh, Japan and Korea, very popular. So how does that fit in with chess? And should you know should those games be played instead? Um, well, I think I think uh, that that in, in the European or North American context, I mean chess is very well, very well established uh, now. But uh, I, I, I think that, I mean, from my own experience of teaching these different games in the classroom, chess has some special characteristics which uh, go down well with, with children. I mean, uh, they like they like the pieces. <laughs> uh, they like how they look, how they feel. They like to touch the pieces. Um, the moves that are of the, the chess pieces uh, form a kind of uh, a satisfying arrangement of um, of geometry, so it's uh, orthogonal, diagonal. Um, there's a kind of strange L-shaped type of move going on there as well. So it's fairly comprehensive uh, the geometry of chess. You get a a fascinating game from a relative relatively small array of movement types and I think that uh, that explains its great success um, but uh, I don't think um, but I, I would agree with you that if there's a game which is popular within a particular country or society then I think it's worthwhile examining 
whether some of the benefits of chess could be achieved by one of these alternative games. You mentioned some games in, in parts of Africa. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are games that are part of the, the culture, and so it may very well be worthwhile focusing on, on, on those games. Uh, but I think we would leave that to the, the, the country experts to, to, to answer that. So I know heads would turn towards that. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, would you like to? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'll pass over to Anton. Let, let the country experts. <laughs> Um, well, my, my initial thought is just that it's more accessible. Um, I mean, if you if you go to any kids' store in South Africa, we call it crazy store. I don't know if you also have a crazy store. Yeah, there's not not necessarily linked to kids. But I mean, you buy all the kids' toys there, and if you buy um, what's that, Ludo and snakes and ladders and all that, you get a chess set as part of that. And and also chess is part of the in South Africa with the Olympic Committee. It's part of the top ten. Um, priority sports. So it's being supported. And and I think for kids, for instance, um, most grandpas and grandmas and, and mums and dads can play chess. So if they want to learn, they can ask maybe one of the parents or a sip or you know, someone in the family. But I think some of the other games in South Africa are just not um, that familiar. Yeah. Um, uh, Alexi Root. I actually also wanted to address that why chess question. Um, in addition to my role of chessable, where I talked about chessable research awards, which are available to university students worldwide and faculty research uh, sponsors worldwide. Uh, so chess would give those Western chess, international chess would give opportunities to do research at the university level. I also work for University of Texas at Dallas. And that's one of many universities giving full-ride scholarships for chess. That's four years of tuition, fees, and housing for chess players. And so we want to give students in Africa opportunities to go to universities worldwide. Right? Then they need to have a chance to learn chess. Now, as they pointed out, not every child will pursue chess to that level but to not give them the opportunity to have the chance to get a university education in, on for free and is, seems to me a mistake that we want to give them that chance. And of course, there's even a famous movie, Queen of Kachwe, about a girl from the slums of Uganda who got a full ride university scholarship to Northwest University in Washington State and completed her four years of college education and now has a great career. So I guess that would be part of my answer. It's, it's a game that's giving um, children opportunities to go on to university. And then once they're in university, get chessable research awards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I can just add to that, even for myself, Chase, pay, Chase and Apple paid for all my studies up to my master's degree, all my law degrees. So. I mean, it's, it's just accessible, yeah. Hey, a question from uh, Neil Ditch from the United States. Mm -hmm. This is just a practical question. As you're putting together the design of your classes for training teachers, uh, you, you pointed out that there is a certain amount of basic training in chess that they have to have. How do you construct that? Do you have prerequisites on the amount of chess that someone comes in with, and then in your class, how many days of training do you have, and what percentage of that goes to actual training in chess versus training in the tools and making the connections of using chess as an educational tool? Okay, this is very interesting. I explained the Bali Island. <laughs> <laughs> I explain the experience of the uh, Balearic Island, which is our teachers throughout 60 years, 60, with 60 hours. During the first course, they do 20 hours, and this is introduction to chess. And um, we're talking not about how the movements of the pieces, but also about pedagogy, about the smart method, about mm, some, some questions that Somebody said before that we uh, we thinking that we need to make an answer that gives resource to the teachers. 
Later, we say for material continua, and we gave maybe chess and mathematics. This is a different school for the teachers because how to use chess to uh, teach uh, mathematics, you know. And, and so on. So, first of all, we give them all the resources, but for in the school, make, we say, um, I don't know what is in the name in English. We're trying to take a thing out of the class. Uh, no, at the end of the, the, the course, they must do a, a school program. It's a school program. A school program with, with chairs for all the school. For all the school, they must do this, this program. And this is fantastic because when we start just a few just a few uh, teachers want to, 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 to go to the, to the castle. But for example, in the last school that now is on, is on the way, is chess and mathematics. We, op we offer just 30, 30, 30, 30 uh, bases, no? for 30 teachers. Now we've got 40, but our waiting list is, is about 100. 100 teachers that they want to learn and to take this course, you know, chess and mathematics. So, after many years that we are working in this way, I think in this is a correct way. We give them a lot of hours, a lot of hours to, to prepare. Uh, we give the resource, the resource now also give a platform, a platform to, to, to start with the children. So, this is our program. Um, Boris, you also have some observations. Yes, uh, thanks for your question, uh, Neil. Uh, I can answer it for Germany. So you, was at, you were asking about prerequisites. Um, in Germany, we experience, or especially in my school, we do have some children uh, coming from abroad, refugees, um, and they um, they do not have these language skills uh, in the German language. But all, some of them do play chess. So this is the first step into the class, into the community. And if they do play chess and they know it very good, or uh, they learned it by their grandfather, um, I would use him as an assistant teacher. So the kind of achievement this kid will have in class is that it was helping others to learn chess on this way. This is one way to do it. Um, then you're asking, uh, we have it uh, weekly, 90 minutes. Um, and there is a pretty clear rule, uh, not at least for, by John. Uh, max is uh, the age of the kids multiplied by two, uh, at least half of the lesson. And um, you have to introduce some of the mini games. And after a while, you have a database, so uh, children can choose from it if they want to play with it, which, which mini game. Yeah. And if they want to, they can play with all the pieces. Uh, so the only thing you have to keep in mind that there will be chaos anyway. Um, and uh, to come back to Tiago, who has just left, I want to just say that John uh, developed a, a great number of strategy games uh, that can be played on the chessboard. Just have an advertisement here for him, so he has to do it on, on his behalf. Uh, which is great. Uh, so don't use only chess pieces yet. Yeah? You can have tokens and uh, anything else that yeah? you can imagine, which is be which would be fun and uh, delivering the skills we want to teach as well. So thank you. Hey, thank you, um, Boris. Boris, by the way, kindly brought over uh, about another 1,500 uh, helmet pieces. We <coughs> 1,600. 1,600 helmets. <laughs> Uh, which uh, we uh, can't get in England, so we have to get from Germany. Okay, I think uh, we need to you know, yeah, yeah. just wanted to add something to it. So regarding chess in education training courses, okay. I think we have to distinguish uh, between yes. no, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. yeah, uh, distinguish between uh, uh, training chess players to teach chess and uh, training or introduce chess to, uh, to teachers. And there are uh, different approaches in different countries where they are already doing these programs, but working with these lovely people in the funnel uh, for the last couple of years, Rita, Jerry, Philip, Beth, Boris, and John. So we were already uh, were talking a lot about these uh, strategy games and mini games. And uh, I just would like to highlight the aspect. So when you start uh, 
teach or train trainers, uh, chess players or teachers, the aspect to start with these little mini games, I think it's really crucial or important because a lot of kids find chess uh, very complex, in intimidating at first. And uh, when I teach and uh, ask them, do you play chess at home? Because I just meet them once a week. And I think it's not really enough, so I would like to encourage them to uh, play at home. And uh, they are always saying that, oh, it's too complex for my mom, for my dad, they don't know how to play chess. But when we introduce them these mini, mini games, they can go home, explain the rules, because it's really simple, and we just want to encourage them uh, playing these games, because they do have the same educational benefits. So there are a lot of teachable moments in these games, and uh, we can talk about strategy, problem solving, decision making, seeing the, the, the big picture and uh, still paying attention to details. So there is still a lot to talk through these games, which are much more uh, simple and uh, accessible to uh, kids. So I just wanted to highlight this aspect that whenever you start to train teachers, mm -hmm. but, uh, I think we should start with this. And if you want to play one of these games, Brigitte has a table on the uh, <laughs> on the, uh, uh, on Joe, let me add something. Please. Yeah. Just let me add something to Neil. And I, uh, uh, I know that's how going to But I want to explain also the, how the Spanish Federation, because I am the secretary of the, of the Spanish Federation for trainers, um, for monitors, you know. Um, I think it also is important to, 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 to see how federation, how federation made the task for chess in a school. Uh, here in Spain, we got different titles, official titles. If you want to be a technical sportivo level one, you must go to the classroom for about one year. One year, you know, one year, and you get a title for the government, not for the academy, not for the federation. You get the title for the government, for you know, like a mechanic, like a, a physics, like a everything. Later, we got another title: is technical deportivo nivel two, nivel two. This is two years, two years student, you know, very hard, very hard, and very complicated matters. But in this way, we use this title for competitive teachers outside of the school. Um, in the last year, maybe 10 years, I can remember now, we make another course for the Federation, Docentes Level 1, Docentes, Docentes is Teachers. It's very simple, very simple course. Um, we collaborate with Chess Plus a lot of time, and we make Echo 101 and Docentes Level, level 1 in the same time, in the same time, because this is uh, to introduce the people to use in chess in a school to the teachers. So I want to explain how in Spain the Federation, the Spanish Federation, working in this way. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's clear that um, in some countries, uh, Spain, Germany also, there's a sort of graduated system of qualifications. Uh, I was always impressed to discover that in, in Germany there's a qualification for selling men's underwear and uh, this is uh, an extreme version of uh, qualifications I think. <laughs> um, okay uh other questions yes, yeah, um, in those three days um we didn't talk about sponsoring schools i'm a school teacher in a primary school and i'm a middle school and um, the fact that i get 10 chess boards or three from the Spanish foundation it starts a whole new world for the kids. Now, 13 years later, all the kids in our school are playing chess. And um, what can your organization do about that? Because schools in Belgium don't have money to start with such a, such a beautiful programs online. Uh, we, we don't have the money to, to get the children on that, or we don't have the money to get all the electronic things and, and the big chess boards, I think you have to get 500 euros to start. Where can you find that from the organizations or the government or I don't know who 
examples with that. I think it's very important. Yeah. Uh, what I'd like to do is park that question uh, about two sessions later. Because this session is about teaching and qualification of the teaching. What you're talking about here is <coughs> how can um, schools get access to some resources for developing care? So, for example, in, in the UK, uh, best of schools and communities uh, will be providing uh, equipment to schools that want to take on uh, on chess if those schools fulfil uh, certain criteria. So um, there there are answers to your question, but not, not for this session. If I may uh, move on. Any uh, any other? Uh, oh, two Here we go. Um, in Hong Kong, we have, um, so I'm, um, I'm principal of a chess school in Hong Kong. We have a small chess program that we run in schools um, and so on in Hong Kong. Um, in terms of the national chess program in Hong Kong, there's kind of a, a tiered school system. So you have the international schools, which are the English speaking um, section of school, and then you have the local schools, which make up the majority of schools. But this kind of pool of talent isn't really being uh, promoted uh, with regards to chess. Um, and one of the problems with talent, you know, uh, local, the local school system with the Cantonese speaking mm -hmm. population. So, um, one of the problems is that um, schools would like some sort of accreditation for teachers and for their own teachers. Uh, but the problem is that uh, their native language is Cantonese. So, what kind of uh, what what kind of solution? Uh, if any, do you see for, for, the, for the teachers in countries that uh, they're not speaking a, a language that's popularly spoken around the world, like French or Spanish or English? Do they have English as a second language? Yes, uh, they do, but it may affect the uptake of, of the program, uh, depending on what language you, you, you train the teachers in. Because I thought um, chess um, in Dutch to French speaking children mm. from kindergarten on. Mm. The earlier you start, the better it is for their language yes. skills as well. Yes. So if you don't find teachers in Cantonese, maybe you can find English teacher. Yes. Yeah. Coming to the schools. I mean, probably, uh, I suppose what I'm asking is uh, the training for, mm -hmm. for, for teachers. Um, what language are you available? Okay, I suppose it's possible to train the teachers through English, but not all local school teachers speak uh, enough English to be able to get through that course. I can understand that. But there are some ways for um, teachers who do not master the foreign language very well, are afraid to speak it and so on. There are some tips and tricks for language teachers. For example, use yeah. puppets. And the puppets speak the foreign language. So if the teacher makes uh, errors, it's, it's not his, his fault, it's <laughs> the puppet. Yeah. Yes, I can. I imagine that you can do it through English teachers if you don't find Cantonese teachers. Well, I think. Okay, um, actually, we did have some experience in Hong Kong. So, finally, uh, yeah, you know, there is my Hong Kong one. Right, I'm teaching uh, for a collective chess as well. But uh, yeah, about your question, that's the only funny thing that my uh, old friend from Hungary, he is an English teacher, chess player, and he has a program, uh, chess and English. Actually, he started with Judith Bolger. He is, uh, uh, has a platform, he is also uh, uh, teaching, uh, uh, training uh, uh, teachers, and uh, I can contact him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Adia Lomanova from Kazakhstan, welcome to London. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I represent Kazakhstan Chess Federation and we are about to implement uh, chess as an elective course in our primary schools. And we do expect some, uh, one of the main uh, steps in this project is to train school teachers. And we do expect some uh, resistance from their side since it's a uh, uh, really they overwhelming for them and it's, it's a lot of uh, work to do for them and uh, in from your experience did you face this resistance from the teachers and uh, what uh, recommendations can you give to start with this yeah. um 
I, I just wonder, I, I see uh, Joey Nash is almost bouncing out of his seat there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joey, Joey is chairman of Speedy's Education Commission, and I think Joey would like to say a few words. It was fun. I've been I've been training teachers for over 20 years as, as as many of these and consistently those teachers uh come in with almost zero knowledge of chess and often extremely intimidated by the game on the first day that intimidation that we, we address that intimidation and, 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 and laugh about it, you know, because I will ask them a simple question on a scale of one to five. One, you're pretty sure that you've seen a chess set. Five, I'm a really strong player. Consistently, I will get answers of zero, negative one, and negative two. <laughs> And occasionally I'll get like a 1.5, 2.1. So there's this uncertainty. Uh, I remember one training in which on the first day I went, you know, I'm introducing myself to the teachers and out of 21 teachers, only one teacher had ever played chess. And so I go to the first table. I, you know, my name is Jerry. And they say, I don't know how to play chess. I, that's okay. Yeah. Well, and I can't learn. I say, you are the perfect person. And, and they said, well, if you want somebody who doesn't know and can't learn, you've got the perfect person. I go around to 20 more teachers and the response was almost the same. So that was day one. On day two, by middle of the day, we were getting ready to go to lunch. And so there was some chess problems on the demonstration boards. I said, you know, take, you can work together, you know, take some the five by seven card, see if you can solve them. I couldn't get them to stop and go to lunch <laughs> because they were so engaged. And that is what typically happens if you make the training fun and as they've talked about, you make it relative to what they're already doing in the classroom. And then they realize, here's now a tool that I didn't have before to teach all the skill. And now, what then I have to say to the teachers is, you know, you're doing a really good job of behaving just like your students. I need you to stop playing chess to come to the next activity. These are the same teacher oh, I can't learn. And so if you make that training uh, appropriate and relative to what they're doing and you make it fun, which is as they've talked about you want them to make it fun for their students, you model that in the training and once you get past that first part of it and they realize I can do this, then they will become your advocates those teachers will then become advocates for other teachers they will be the ones saying you need to come to this. You won't have to sell that anymore. So that, that's been probably experience of probably all of these folks and a number of others that if you make it appropriate and you make it enjoyable and you get past that intimidation, that no longer becomes a factor and then they become the salespersons for what you're trying to do. So, Thank you. Very good. Thank you. One one final question from uh, Jim Edgerton. Yeah, I'll make it more simple. In a previous life, I was a math teacher, and I taught at the middle school and the high school level. And one of the problems I had is what gets about when and where the big W's, you know. And and so I'm like, when I was in high school, it was a mirror, geometry. It was like there it is. I went to my department head and I said, "Can I do a, a chess unit?" He said, "Go for it." And, and it was off the kids learned it. But you know, I right now I'm teaching a night class, and I'm a kindergartner. And I have a fifth grader in my class. And, and the kid in Gardner is absolutely right on. Everything I said, what's the threat? Oh, this and that. And the fifth grader is going, what is he talking about, right? So I asked the father, well, how does your child know so much in kindergarten? Because he says to me, well, when he gets done with his algebra homework, he starts to play chess. 
a kindergartner is doing algebra. I'm like, oh my. So you don't want to stop the kids who are there. And what I find is that just just blows away the grade level distinctions. Like in math, when I was teaching, I would give in a book and say, your kids need to know fractions before they get out of here, you know, or they need to know decimal thing. And it's like just as it, it just goes across and it's beautiful, but it's hard for a teacher to say, do we do openings in third grade? Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, 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 when you start with the end game. So I'm just the question is, are there any ways of uh, people working on trying to define what and the where and the when? So that it's it's kind of universal. It's not in, in Spain we do this, in America we do that, and it just and it can bring it all together. But uh, what a loaded question. I'm sorry, uh, but if anybody has something about it, because I've got experience and I know where I think it fits in, but that doesn't mean it, it's going to work for you because I was a math teacher and you know I played chess. <laughs> I've got a short answer for you. There's no one size fits all. Yeah. And if you ask the child, they will tell you what they want to learn. So you do not you do not teach a child what they're not ready for. They will either get bored or they will start getting I call it naughty, but we don't we're not supposed to say that, um, unwanted behavior. And it's often because they don't understand it. If you speak over their heads, they will start predicting with their friends. Because they don't want anyone else to see that they don't understand. So when a child, that's why, I, I'm not sure if you attended the sessions on Friday, but when I said, you have to know your, your, your student. And if you know your student and you listen to your student and the questions they ask, you answer their questions. And a child nowadays with online stuff, they will come to me. I have a seven-year-old that I coach in, in South Africa. And he came to me the other way and he said to me, uh, yeah, I want to talk about the Queen's Gamer today. And I'm like, okay. I thought, hey, did he see the movie? I said, which one? Uh, this is child seven. He said, Well, the opening. I said, Okay, so tell me what you know. And he showed me some stuff, and I showed him some stuff. He said, Oh, I actually want to know this live. So, okay, then we go into this live. And then I mentioned something else, and then I could see, you know, the wheel turn, hamster dead. Okay, we stop there. And then we, we revise on what we did. So, stay in touch with your students. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a, such a, a stimulating session, this. But unfortunately, we have to go okay. now and go for, for coffee when the uh, and the next session is going to start. I think at ten ten thirty. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
<clears throat> Just for all students, so this session is a uh, student-centered perspective on chess and education. What are the benefits, uh, students with special needs, and also um, with a uh, focus on a way on those students for whom we want to get into the STEM or STEAM subjects. Uh, chess has a great playground. So we have... Uh, Great speakers in the session. And the first one is Marion Schöttendreyer. Um, yes, it's a German name. Uh, also, she is uh, uh, what is what is the assistant principal, assistant headmaster uh, at uh, Peter Anderson High School in Lund in Sweden. And um, that means she, her, her school, a secondary school, is really just gymnasium. It's the last uh, grades before the might go on to university, so it's from 15 or 16 up to 18, 19. Eden rules, so it's um, uh, that kind of school, and uh, chess is a little bit different there, and it's also one reason why here um, for, for children is not exactly accurate, so that's why we call this uh, chess for all students. And Marion, please, um, we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Nice to have you all here. You have already heard my name. It's Marion. I think it's so nice to pronounce it in English. It sounds uh, it's like Robin Hood to uh, all the people <laughs> in Sweden. I always have to explain my name. And then when I say it's like Robin Hood, then ah, then they know. Um, as I told before, I work in a, at a secondary high school in Lund. Uh, and uh, it's a very special school because it's uh, it started five years ago with 120 students and they built a whole total new building and we will go into this building in August. And in five years, we, uh, we will be 1,600 students. So it's a, uh, it's a new school, uh, it's growing all the time and we are working with to get a, a school culture. You have a start, you will start with all together, so all the teachers together. And um, I have seen that chess has already become part of the school uh, culture and I want I wanted to be part of the school culture because I have seen it has a very positive impact on students that struggle in different ways not only in the classroom but also outside of the classroom um, and I just um, as you heard about why am I in Sweden yes I started with a PhD in plant ecology and after this PhD, I thought, what should I do now? And then it was fate. They were searching for a teacher in plant ecology, which was uh, the thing I have worked with. So I became a teacher. When I was asked as an 18 years old, what do you want to be? I said, I have no clue. I do not want to be um, a doctor because I cannot see blood. And I do not want to be a teacher because I was thought a little bit pity about some of our teachers who really struggled with it. And then I started to become a teacher and, and I loved it. It was really great to be a teacher after you had done several things and then start there. And, um, and I met a lot of people, uh, students that are really great, that are ambitious. And I have met a lot of students that struggle in school in different ways. Um, and to the, um, today, to struggle in school, they can struggle in very different ways. They can be over ambitious, can be social and shy anxiety. But I speak today a little bit about the students you always hear who are always at the wrong place and which can be really demanding when you work at school. And um, so how uh, what I have seen is chess can help to make a more quiet environment in school. Um, 
uh, here are the color I call it hops. I really love him, and he is one of these childs always going into trouble. He does not. He cannot concentrate. Sit in the classroom. It's much too difficult. Uh, so I just very cool. What are these? They have difficulties to concentrate, and I, I think as we heard uh, before, it's as a teacher you have to see the uh, the um, students stop listening when uh, how well, what you will do. But some students have a very short concentration ability. It's about uh, and as I told before, my students they are sixteen to nineteen year old. And they still have these problems. Many of you see this in, in in primary schools and others, and you always hope it will disappear. But they have the struggle all the way. They cannot sit still. Teachers have to work that they do not leave the classroom. And they have low impulse control. So when they get angry, it's more or less from not angry at all to be very angry. And this in between is often missing, and they have very di much difficult to come back. And we do not have many of the students, but if you have been in a classroom, and then if you have two of those ch ch children or students in your classroom, it can be quite demanding uh, to work with it. And if you have maybe five, six in the whole school, then you then you hear them and see them in the environment you have together. And so I see chess as a social tool in our school, and. Um, we heard before, if you are working with chess, you need um, teachers who really are good teachers. And what I have seen, uh, they have to be really dedicated. They have, and if it's uh, with chess, they have to be dedicated in chess, but they also have to be dedicated in teaching. And the children and the students really have to feel that uh, the teachers like them. And here is uh, the teacher who started this chess culture in our school. Uh, it's Enrique. And I, 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 before I came here, I said, OK, we have to meet one hour. And then I, I want to ask you a little bit about all your experience. When, because I've met him in an earlier school where I worked. Uh, we worked there together. It was the same effect. He had this, he worked, played chess with the students, and it made this quieter environment. And then I came to this place, and he applied to a place at our school, and I said, oh, I want him again, because he's so great. And I asked him, and he, and he says, yeah, when I, he's often, when he has a break, then he, uh, he has some time, then he goes where the students are, he takes a chess game, and then he plays chess with the students, and students like this teacher, because he has this great relationship. He's not a friend, they respect him, but uh, they know... Um, he really likes them. He likes all the students, even those struggling. Um, and he says, I never say we, uh, it's hard to, exp um, to perform, um, translate from Swedish to English. Uh, so I tried it. I say, we do not, I do not say we play chess. I say we train chess. Uh, because when you train, then it's okay to lose. And it's also, he said, for me, it's also easier to, to be creative. I can train, then I can try something new, even if no, even if I think, oh, I maybe lose. If I try this, it's okay because you train. It makes the game much more creative, and it may also make it easier for the students who are not good in chess yet, just to be there to train and to play with other students. And I have seen that there are more and more students coming together playing chess in our school, and it's not that uh, school has said. We want you to play chess. We just bought five chess plays that we that they can uh, get when they want to play. They go to the office, uh, to the secretary, head secretary, and they, they fetch it. Uh, they have to give something so that we know the game is coming back. Uh, and then they they mobile maybe they play a bit. They go back, get their mobile back. So, so this is start of a culture at our school that I have seen. And. Uh, uh, I ask students as well, what is it, why do you play chess? When they're sitting there, then I sit uh, with them, I say, why do you play chess? And one student says, I like playing chess because it's not a game depending on luck. Uh, so it's, uh, and I think some of the students, they all sometimes feel mistreated. When you are a child, sometimes misbehaving, uh, then at some point, some teacher says, oh, we are doing this, and at that point they have not done anything. And this is, they always remember. 
they are mistreated and it's not mine, but in chess, uh, you cannot be mistreated, the opponent cannot mistreat you because it's what you are doing, it's uh, your own, uh, your knowledge, you can show what you can. And, and when I, there, I, I see the guys and some of these, the students, there are some of the cool guys. They can, uh, you know, they are 19, some have these hoodies, so nearly if you see them on the street, you might become a little bit afraid. And I do not get afraid of these because I know they are really nice persons. <laughs> they are not dangerous at all, they just uh, clothe a little bit like this. And they sit there and they're playing chess. You see here some, um, I have to, uh, they're sitting there and two are playing and then another one is playing Then I know they all go in three different classes. They have different backgrounds. They did not know each other, but they, uh, this is the place where it goes over the, the cultural backgrounds. Because in schools, it's very hard uh, to get students with different backgrounds to be together. It's not so easy. Often, even if you try all this, and and as a chess becomes cool, it also has started to find its way into education. In Sweden, you have to be uh, at, the, at the last in the last year, you have to make a great, um, you have to write kind of exam. Um, and there's one student in programming, he is writing a program for chess scoreboard in our new school, so that um, the idea, as Enrique told me, <laughs> he's behind this as well, it was in his class, uh, then we can have kind of, if the students play, they can put in their names, and if they play it together with each other, so you can see why, where are you on the scoreboard. Um, and it shall be in the entrance when you come into the school. And I think just by that you get chess as kind of uh, culture in our school. So the positive consequences I see, as I said before, students from different classes, uh, they work together, they train chess together, um, and it's less noise in the places outside. And we are really, right now, before we go to this new school, it's so crowded. If there's a break, uh, I always have to calculate five minutes more to come from one part to the other because you really have to go in between. Uh, so all people visit our school really say, wow, they're crowded. And this is where we will be next year. It will be not crowded at all. Uh, it will be wide spaces. We have places where students can sit, a cafeteria with places where they can be, and I think there will be our chess boards. Um, library, um, study halls, um, and we have now have to think about building up this culture. How do we have this feeling that we are together, that we are one school, we have to get from this crowded place into this big place. We will go there with uh, 750 students, and in five years we will be 1,600 students. So we really have to work to have this culture this feeling, this is our school, and I hope that chess will be part of the school, and I would also like, and I thought maybe I'd find someone here working with chess and with, um, to evaluate the positive impact of chess in school, and I think there might be something, as I'm a little bit new to this topic, because I'm, uh, the, and when I sat here, I made the picture with Enrique, I think the last time I played chess before was 12 years ago, so <laughs> the students were, oh, you can play chess. And just like this, uh, I felt I come a little bit closer to this, but um, so I like the feeling of chess. I like the positive impact of chess in school, and I really want to have this. And I think I will, I will start playing chess again, <laughs> because I really got inspired here. So I want to thank all of you for really great inspiration, all the great talks you have here. Uh, I take a lot of inspiration with me. and if you in Lund, and you want to see how oh, she's talking about chess, that yeah. I will visit this new school in August, we will be there at Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, we will take questions at the end of the session, and um, next speaker is uh, Beatrice Papacini uh, from Italy. Um, Beatrice, are you still in Sweden? Yeah, in, in, in Lund, yeah, in Lund, yeah. It's, it's, it's funny a, that it's funny, yeah. you could have been yeah. on yeah. <laughs> yeah. there. Uh, I, yes, I crossed this with the Marriott uh, schools 
quite every day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's well, a coincidence. Um, yeah. And uh, Beatrice is, uh, I think, by training you were uh, an engineer. Yeah, and you before know, moving, space engineer. Yeah. Even, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. even in uh, something like rocket science. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, ago, I to the and then you, you entered to become uh, a teacher. Yeah. And uh, your, your field is science yeah. education, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And uh, you're Math, talking. Yeah was as chess, uh, connecting chess with uh, Steam and yeah. chess as a creative playground. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. And um, so I am a, um, a math teacher, um, and I'm now I'm a teacher trainer for um, coding and robotics in primary and secondary school and using a creative learning approach. In 2010, uh, I have been collaborating with uh, um, kindergarten to, um, in a small village to a psychomotricity psychomotric project uh, where I explored um, how chess is related to coding and robotics uh, and how chess can be a valid option for this age. So uh, why, why chess can be considered as a playground for creativity? And what is creativity? What, people, what, do, uh, what do people think about creativity, creativity and a creative person, a creative um, product, and uh, uh, how creativity takes from? And how in innate, is an innate skill? So Mitchell Resnick, uh, Mitchell Resnick uh, um, in his book, Lifelong Kindergarten, Cultivating Creativity with Four Ps, um, identifies four main uh, misconceptions. So uh, creativity is uh, um, uh, as a, an artistic expression. Few people are creative. Uh, something is uh, uh, something innate and happens and as a flash on sight. But uh, uh, Instead of creativity, we can refer to different levels. So psychologists, they call big C and um, small C, little C, proceed and medium C. So there are different levels of creativity. We have creativity in all fields. Everyone can be creative. So creative for all. <laughs> and uh, creativity needs a hidden time. And, uh, and <coughs> it's important. Creativity can be taught and can be, uh, we can nourish uh, creativity in our children. So in chess as well, there is a big C creativity and a small C creativity. But this little C is not about uh, the age of this child, it's about that this that represent a, a new player. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, creativity, is, uh, creativity is a complex concept. Uh, is uh, Teresa Marbile um, identify creativity elements, components in expertise? That is knowledge that you acquire um, in non formal, formal, and formal uh, situations. And uh, motivation is also a big element of creativity and uh, motivation can be intrinsic as strings so it's also a mm, important part and finally creative thinking skills and um, but they will need all of these elements be in a, a favorable uh, environment so what is creative thinking skills and it's like a matrioska finally and mm, so it's a um, we can consider um, many elements um, taking part in creative thinking. So divergent uh, thinking, convergent thinking, persistent, and many, many, many uh, elements. And um, so creative thinking is in uh, some ways an ability to come up with the original and um, effective solution, taking risks. So um, taking risks is a a uh, big part of the creativity. Um, so um, researchers consider divergent thinking and convergent thinking um, a big uh, a part of uh, uh, creative thinking. <coughs> creative thinking. And um, divergent, divergent thinking seeks many parts, uh, many possibilities, it's not judgmental, it doesn't evaluate 
um, the mind wandering. Uh, instead, the convergent thinking is focused on the task. Um, different mechanisms happening with convert, uh, divergent and convergent thinking, but uh, they are alternate. When you wonder, you cannot focus on the task. It's important to recognize these two kind of thinking. Um, finally, why it's important in education. So divergent thinking is considered as a good predictor, but it's a one it's a really, we say, small part. It's a good predictor for um, potential creativity. And also in Oxypisa, in, uh, did uh, in 2022 um, a test uh, um, about creative thinking that you can find on the, the website. And they used a part of divergent, uh, um, uh, divergent thinking tolerance and test. So just to give an idea of what this, uh, uh, this kind of, this is an alternative use test, AUT. And, uh, um, and that use a lot of creativity researches and also in the few chess researches that we have in chess. Um, I will go to. So we, we can see, we can understand that creative thinking, uh, creativity is something really complex. So uh, when we measure, when we make assessment about um, creative thinking is a, really a small part of the big, big complex uh, landscape. And um, finally, how to teach creati creativity. So can Robinson specify that question should be open-ended? So with multiple solutions, I could add, uh, we can add maybe without solution. And um, sustain it, it's important to sustain uh, the collaboration in this uh, uh, part. Um, so we can teach taking risk, falling, failing. So um, how, to how to create an environment when children can fall without um, getting hurt. So a playground where children can experiment, can explore, can use different languages, uh, different levels and passion. So supporting creative in multiple ways can be, can be helpful for motivating children to passionate our students. So we need to use different language to give them voice. Creativity, uh, creativity is important to give voice to students, to people. And uh, there are different ways to approach the world. Here is a, an example. I've chosen two extremes that we are two children experience the, the same story in a chessboard. And I have asked from, um, for making a drawing. And so one drew the pattern while the other one was instead impressed by the story that I told. And that doesn't mean that one didn't see the pattern or why one didn't see the story, that uh, they are different. And, sorry. <laughs> and um, so one is focused on the object, the one is the other was in the subject. So dramatists are more interested on humanity in some way. And we saw yesterday two great examples with the Michael, the TikToker Michael, and uh, he dramatized, he dramatized chess in a super way, and pa a Pavel focused on diagrams with the, this astonishing AI platform. It, it, I have been impressed by both of them. It's, uh, it's been, there are also extremes in some way. So another question, how children differently approach, um, appreciate, approach the puzzles, the, the game, they are completely two different um, word about that. So puzzle can be considered a playground for divergent thinking and uh, convergent thinking. So it's a really a good playground, but they can explore a lot of possibilities, make choices and so on. But puzzle can increase uh, also the, the, the um, expertise. So the, the, the knowledge about chess, is, that is uh, also important. Uh, but how it is important to ask how many ways? This is a very big, good question for my, also for math teachers. And um, how many ways where children can express their own thinking. 
so the, and discuss this uh, with others. <coughs> a question can be how many ways, for example, you can have checkmate, but not in, a, in one move, for example. So yesterday, I had also showed that how many ways. So many ways, many different ways, many paths. Mm, it's not important that it's tried or around that for, for divergent thinking. So our creativity can be expressed also. Quindi, so <laughs> I call this I call surprise and puzzle because the, it looks without maybe solution or it's impossible. But can white really win? It's a quite famous uh, uh, puzzle. So in my in expert eye, I see the black <laughs> superiority, but we know how the problem is uh, discussed. So the, so the white win with an extraordinary win sacrifice. So um, this is, uh, um, we can see how chess can play a role really on developing persistence skills. One of the element of creativity is persistence. So an understanding the meaning of also to breaking, breaking the rules uh, in chess and in life. So um, when, oh, oh, sorry, when all is lost, when all is lost can be, can be a way out. Maybe not, but we have to fight until the end. Um, so chess for me is the game, uh, is the game because contain something deeper in our, uh, mind, our soul, how to to approach the life, how we are, can approach uh, our um, our education. And finally, I end with uh, with two questions. Well, the one question is how the time influence uh, creativity. Uh, we can train to uh, wonder. I mean, to the divergent thinking. We can train the divergent thinking to to answer very fast. And uh, or is something that block? I don't know. It's an open question. The other open question is creativity transferable. Uh, there are a lot of discussion of researches that can be not completely uh, completely transferable. Transferable. So um, creativity is so important to let people yeah and the war um, give um, express their own voice and also dealing with the complexity that nowadays we have. Thanks. Thanks, Beatrice. Quick question for me, what is empty time or uh, hole in time? You have this in the early, yeah, that's so important. Short, short, yeah. uh, okay, let's, let, let's skip it. Um, Next speaker is already here with us, Mikkel Nörkaf from uh, Denmark, from Dansk Skoriska. And um, it's always a pleasure. Uh, they have been uh, at our conferences a lot with many interesting inputs. And today we get a new subject from them, um, but which uh, is relatively close related, close related with the other speakers. Um, and that's uh, about the mental aspect of uh, chess and education uh, again uh Mikko, uh, I, I i know you have a lot to say so without further ado thank you stefan and thanks for uh, for having me back uh, i had the pleasure of being a few times before and uh, survivors from those momentous occasions will know that i'm not necessarily a man of a few words, let alone a few slides, but I've uh, I've taken the liberty of hiding a few of them and put a QR code at the end of the presentation. You can scan that, and you'll get some more background information that I can uh, relate to you here. So um, I'm here to speak a bit about um, our special needs uh, intervention in Denmark called the Brain on the Curriculum. But I'll say a few words about the uh, organization I'm representing. Uh, at first, we were founded in 1960 by uh, uh, teachers and headmasters. We now work uh, professionally and have done so for uh, 15 years, with about 2,000 uh, teachers in Denmark who use uh, scholastic chess in some capacity. We have every third school in Denmark as a member, and we make intervention and projects with 
uh, the government with municipalities and foundations and uh, endowments. What I'm going to speak a bit about today is our special needs program that we're running in uh, 49 schools from uh, 2021 throughout um, 2024. It's called the Brain on the Curriculum. It's not entirely poetic, but that's how it translates into English. Um, we reach uh, about 1,400 special needs kids, and these are a wonderful mixed bag of uh, young people. Uh, with a lot of strengths, a lot of abilities, and uh, if I had had the resources, I would have brought some of them for you uh, today to to talk to and to uh, to hear about their experience. But that was not possible, so uh, I'll just have to explain that these young kids uh, have obviously, since they are in special needs education, a number of uh, challenges as well. Uh, about one third have a psychiatric diagnosis such as ADHD or autism. Quite a few are socially deprived or have social issues outside school. Uh, quite a big group within the group uh, have an IQ below average and uh, approximately half of them are dyslexic. The heroes of the story, the central agents here are the teachers. And I'm going to say a lot about how we cooperate uh, with the teachers here. We have 200 of them uh, in this intervention and most of them had a let's call it sketchy knowledge of the game of chess before we got to them. Um, however, they're characterized by uh, the fact that they're highly skilled and they uh, have a lot of love and sympathy and compassion for the kids they work with. External research is being done on this intervention and um, they just uh, delivered sort of the halfway uh, paper about it and I'll say a bit about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. The overall goal is to enhance the students' awareness of mental health, their self-efficacy, and their social competences. And uh, once I've said a bit about the teachers and how we co co collaborate with them, I'll give you a few samples of uh, how the teaching material works. Um, our collaborations take form through the platform Gambit. And actually, you're looking at Gambit right now. I work the presentation into the platform. It's a teacher's tool. So the teachers use the, the platform to uh, prepare the lesson. And by a smart board or a screen, it sort of supports the instruction they're doing in the classroom. There's no uh, digital element for the for the students. They do all their work with uh, over the board or with uh, pen and paper and pencil. Strong thing about Gambit that carries all the lesson is that we can uh, communicate with the teachers through uh, uh, Gambit. They rate the lessons once they're done. Trust pilot, uh, trust pilot principal with one through five stars, and they can write to us. This didn't work. This worked better when I did it this way. I have an idea. Could you build a list and so on and so forth? So that makes for a vibrant um, and very interesting, fruitful uh, collaboration. In a through a digi digital the channel, uh, we've uh, supplied three days of teacher training so far. We'll do another day in uh, August, and we'll do one day uh, in uh, 2024. So uh, for a total of five days of teacher training, and we do visit uh, the schools and the teachers every once in a while uh, with people we employ who are themselves teachers and who have taught extensively uh, scholastic chess at other schools. Um, the central metaphor of the of the material that we use here is the pathways of the brain. We've borrowed this metaphor from the Danish author Anita Plain. She's a sociologist. She has a lot, uh, done a lot to popularize and um, uh, communicate how the brain works. So it's understandable to uh, people who are not psychologists or teachers or, or indeed people who are children. Um, and the idea is that you have parts in your brain and if uh, there's something I have I, I have a very narrow cooking part uh, so I haven't trained cooking very well and if I want to become better at cooking I should trample my cooking part I should practice I should make uh, this path wider just the way I would trample a path in a field or a forest and that's the central metaphor here so if there's something you're struggling with something that's difficult you can actually Brain, you can actually improve, you can make this path wider. And that is work into the uh, material throughout. Um, this is an example of a, um, a lesson where we work with predicting things. How do we predict stuff? And this sort of touches upon the subject that Jerry Nash talked about the other day. 
How do we make a transfer from what we do over the board to other arenas in the kids' lives? How do we build a bridge to that? Uh, so we need to talk about arenas that are not chess-related. When was the last time you predicted something important? I did not predict that there would be a strike here in London. <laughs> they, I should have predicted that. I'll have trouble getting home to Denmark. <laughs> that would be a relevant thing for me to ponder. Uh, and I'm not sure chess has helped me by way of predicting strikes, but that is something to reflect. Well, this is what the kids will be watching and the teacher will read aloud the text next to the diagram and it perhaps they'll translate in some ways, particularly for those uh, who are not uh, told. What happens if white captures the black rook on d3? And bear in mind that they're new to chess. The teachers are new to chess and the kids are new to chess. It's not necessarily an easy task. Um, I've supplied them with an arrow here, sort of indicating what is the capture at hand. And uh, perhaps some of them will notice that, well, if white does indeed capture the rook on d3, the bishop on a4 will capture the white queen, leaving white uh, worse off than he was before. So he should have predicted that, perhaps. Uh, there's another example here. What happens if the knight captures the black queen on d5? Well, some of you, probably quite a few of you, will see immediately then white should have predicted that the black rook would land on d1. Um, delivering checkmates. So this is an example of some exercises we'll do with the entire group. After that, we'll break out into pairs and there'll be a small exercise where uh, you have to predict your partner's ideas. You are to collaborate about landing the knight safely on X, that's on the square F bar as far as I can see, and you're not allowed to touch the M's because those are mines. You're not allowed to talk, talk to each other during the exercise. You need to predict what is going on. What is the idea in your partner's head and collaboratively land the night, the night uh, safely on X. Once the exercise is done and once all the frustration sort of subsides, the frustration that naturally occurs when you're not allowed to talk to your partner about how to solve the problem. This is when it becomes important. Then this is when the teacher gets uh, a chance to build the bridge to everyday life. Now we get to ask questions such as, how did it feel when it went well predicting your teammates' uh, ideas? How did it feel when it got difficult? And can you give some examples of professions or situations or, or people uh, who are very good at predicting uh, things or where it's particularly important to predict things? Once that's done, we do an exercise which has nothing to do with chess. And uh, now we're back to making the deliberate connections. This is sort of a general activity of the board, but, but with the same competency and focus. Predict the next number. Remember to raise your hand when you think you've got the right answer. I think you can practice one, uh, but not all kids will be able to, not, not very quickly. And we do perhaps four or five of these, uh, trying to uh, find a pattern and uh, and then we have the possibility afterwards of talking to the kids. Well, what patterns did you discern? What did you what did you look at? Is there a, is there a method you can you can use somewhere else um, that you've learned here? Once that's done, we talk a bit about the path we've trembled today. We've trembled the path of predicting things, and we have this little exercise in this case. Stand up if you agree. Being able to predict events on the chessboard is cool. Well, most people would say that. That's a nice thing to be able to do. Predictions play no part in traffic. I uh, I usually stand up there, but uh, that's a different <laughs> that's a different thing. I can predict where I will be at this exact time tomorrow. But that's actually quite difficult for me right now. <laughs> yeah, I would stand up if uh, if I agreed with that sentence. So this is how we make deliberate connections in special ed in this intervention, or try to do it anyway. Uh, the halfway results, the insights so far uh, that has been uh, delivered to us by the researchers tells us that the students require words and language, uh, I just, uh, should say acquire words and language for thoughts and emotions. So this actually helps uh, supply the kids with words for what is difficult for a, a larger emotional vocabulary and uh, more words for, for what thoughts they have. The students start and act interacting differently, and this is in a positive fashion. Um, they interact with uh, with peers they don't usually talk to, and they act, interact in a more quiet 
uh, way than usual. And eight out of 12, 12 teachers have found that the intervention has improved the classroom atmosphere and helped battle school absence, which is a huge, pro a huge problem, uh, not only in Denmark, but throughout uh, the Western world. So promising stuff so far, we'll see once we reach 2024, uh, how far we'll get. Um, this was pretty much what I had to say about the brain on the uh, curriculum. The QR code hides all the stuff I didn't get to tell you, but you should uh, feel free to scan it and uh, perhaps uh, send me an email if you want to hear uh, extra stuff about it. I have an uh, English video as well where a few teachers tell a bit about their experience doing uh, the brain on the uh, curriculum. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Michael, you were very fast too. Thank yeah. you. And uh, you're really encouraged to use the opportunity to learn more and to get in touch with Michael. And um, I think um, what you were hinting when the when the kids acquire these words um, uh, and to, to reflect on is also called meta uh, cognition. Meta -cognition yeah. and, uh, it was a subject here a couple of years ago, and it's great to pick this up again. And um, as, as we are really very well on time, uh, you will have chance to ask questions later. And we take our last speaker in this session now, Anastasia Sorokina. Um, she is uh, the chairperson of um, the... Uh, you need a woman, is this? Women's <laughs> yes. Yes. Now I see ACF. So it's uh, the commission. What is the yes. ACF? Is uh, that the Australian Chess Federation? <laughs> no, it's Asian Social Commission, as I represent Australian Chess Federation. So not many of you know that That's... I was born in Belarus, but I moved to Australia when I was 23. And then it was a period of my life when I came back to Belarus, but now I again represent Australia. So it's a little bit too complicated. <laughs> but don't worry, she has not yes. to fly back to Australia very soon. And Oh, yes. You? Yes. Oh. Just, just tomorrow. Oh, just tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Wrong thing. And her topic is autism. And uh, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for introduction, uh, Stefan. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank John to invite me to be here. It's always big pleasure for me, you know, to be in London and for the best chess conference. For me, it's really the best one. Uh, and uh, today I would like to present you our project, Infinite Chess. Uh, it's very difficult, but very meaningful project. You know, uh, as uh, autism spectrum disorder is, is a complex neurological uh, disorder that begin early in life and affect how person act and interact uh, uh, with other communicate, how it's learned and um, different people with uh, autism has different symptoms. For this reason, uh, autism is known as a spectrum disorder, and that's why each of the person with autism have different um, type of strange and challenging. Uh, the way how people with autism learn, think, and problem solve uh, can range from highly skilled and uh, to several challenges. Uh, and uh, I suggest that uh, before uh, my presentation, we uh, watch a video about the girl who has an uh, autism spectrum disorder, about how she feels in her daily life with some things that we are even don't pay attention, you know, like we do something and we don't understand how those people feel. So please. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'm waiting for a coffee. Oh, hello, Brisa. What do you guys want? Skin, soy latte. Damn, soy candy skin. Uh, chocolate, orange juice. So, Dad, I want coffee. Hot uh, chocolate. Great. So I just think you're going to Sarah Center. Can you give me a ride? Yeah, okay. Are you cool with taking a sister? Yeah. Wait. What? I have my own plan. Excuse
So it's very important to remember that each kid with autism has a different uh, feeling, different um, understanding. Uh, no one of them is the same. So the, the teaching kids with autism spectrum disorders, it's a very complex and uh, difficult topic. Uh, and uh, we started our project uh, back in 2019. Uh, and I would say that it was a challenge for us. We didn't know nothing about this, you know. We just was consulting with some NGOs who is working with kids with autism spectrum disorder, and we really try to do our best. As you can see from this picture, you know, we uh, arranged a classroom, we bought the things that the, the NGO suggested us, uh, and. Uh, after two years, I could say that, uh, that we ran this project in Belarus, in Minsk, uh, that we had a lot of uh, uh, good feedbacks from the parents and the, those kids showed really good results. But even with preparing such a nice room for them, you know, with uh, the support of uh, professional uh, people who work <laughs> with the uh, kids, you see those balls, you know, like we prepared four balls, we are, it was suggested for this, and you're thinking that, okay, kids during the chess, they will sit in these balls, they will jump in, and uh, they will um, calm themselves. After one minute, one boy just took a pen and destroyed one ball, you know, completely. So, and destroyed the whole, whole lesson, of course, because, you know, it was a big, uh, big, big noise and everything. So, we have to understand that even suggestion, even that what we we learn, you know, it's it doesn't work uh, like in a the everyday base. So later on, we just put this balls in the, in the corner and keep it as a uh, quiet, uh, calm area for the kids. But uh, yeah, so we have to take an account. It's it's completely uh, could be completely uh, different in each uh, case. So this experiment uh, basically. Uh, turned to a very nice uh, international initiative uh, and our team uh, created a program uh, methodology uh, how to teach uh, uh, kids uh, with autism spectrum disorder with the help of uh, international olympic committee uh, this program was uh, uh, launched and was translated to english french uh, russian and spanish language and actually uh, you can freely uh, download it from our website, infinitechessfide.com. Uh, but we have to understand that uh, before we finish a real uh, research uh, program, this could be count only as a suggested, as a recommended program. So it's not uh, approved yet, but as a recommended program, it's uh, inside you can find uh, all material, how to set up a classroom, how to uh, teach kids, uh, how to prepare them to go to the uh, chess classroom. But because, you know, with kids with autism spectrum disorder, before you start the teaching process, is a big process to prepare them. Uh, where you have to prepare parents. Parents has to do a story, social story with them. You know, like you will go to chess, you will see teacher, teacher's name like this. So all this information uh, you can find in, the, in this uh, methodology. Uh, to teach people, you know, because we saw the big interest, you know, about this uh, uh, project, uh, we organize uh, three educational seminars, Chess for Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder, Learn and, and Teach. 
and, mm -hmm. and the, in each seminar we have almost like more than 100 150 participants from over the 55 countries and uh, our, our speakers uh, there was a, um, not only chess people but people who create this uh, methodology people who work with uh, uh, kids with autism spectrum disorder and they explain basically step by step how to uh, use this program uh, after this, uh, together with the French Chess Federation, uh, FIDE participate in a Chess for Mental Health uh, um, conference, uh, where we also uh, discuss uh, this project and perspective of this project, how, how we can uh, improve. And the same conference uh, uh, we have in Madrid, but a little bit different format, because until uh, last summer 2022, we already achieved uh, the, the um, level uh, when we launched this program in six countries and uh, all our partners, Pep is here, he, he is running the, this program in, in Spain, uh, they exchange uh, of uh, their uh, uh, experience and uh, we have some suggestions how to make it better and we are always still in the progress, you know, how, how to make it better. Uh, uh, after this, uh, uh, we uh, contacted with uh, Chess Scientific Research Institute of uh, ACPU, Armenian State Pedagogic University. I think Tamara is here, yeah? <laughs> Hello? Yes, and uh, they help us with the first research. Uh, it's uh, This research included questionnaire, interviews, video analysis system, and uh, uh, it's a scientifically proof uh, uh, the degree of program impact of kids with autism spectrum disorder. Because before this, uh, all our best feeling it's uh, um, connected only with the uh, very nice uh, feedbacks from parents, from tutors. You know, we saw the results that kids achieved, but still, till now, it's not uh, uh, really scientifically um, proved. Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, this pilot project uh, continue in two in ten countries. Uh, you can see here those countries: it's France, Norway, Spain, Gibraltar, South Africa, Turkey, Albania, uh, Morocco, Mongolia, and Latvia. We started this year, so the first six was our uh, uh, pilot project, and we are almost ready to start project in Asian continent. And we are waiting to start it in New Zealand, Malaysia, Maldives, and Bangladesh. Uh, I have to admit that our program, uh, it's uh, uh, our this methodology, it's um, uh, not only for group of the kids. It could be uh, used by individuals, by parents. Uh, to, to teach their kids uh, how to play chess, but also it could be used uh, in uh, group lessons or even in uh, special needs schools. Uh, so it's, it really depends. If we go to the um, uh, um, school or to the chess club and we uh, collect a group of the kids, then it could be, it should be only small groups, not more than uh, four, six kids. But if you go to the special needs school, so like we have a um, experimental uh, in South Africa, it's a special needs school and uh, uh, it could be a class of the kids with a special needs as well. Uh, so here you can see some photos from uh, our uh, project running in uh, different countries. Um, and now we are uh, uh, in the progress of uh, searching a partner for uh, application for Erasmus pro project, uh, because as I said before, you know, the, uh, it's proved, yes, uh, chess helps kids with autism spectrum disorder to establish themselves, to get new knowledge, to socialize, but we need uh, really scientific uh, proof of this uh, to move forward. And... Um, uh, for now, uh, as a FIDE, we are looking for the partner. So if you know one of the European-based university or you are interested to be a partner to apply for Erasmus project, because we applied already once, uh, we have a good number of the uh, of the marks, but uh, unfortunately it wasn't approved. So we have to, to, to work more in this field and uh, hopefully this project after scientific research uh, could be proved uh, and uh, 
uh, we can we, we can we can go ahead with uh, uh, other countries as well. Um, so uh, follow us in infinitechessfeeder.com. Uh, you can find all information about our project uh, in this website. Also, same as a, a methodology guide. And before I finish, I just want to show you a short video about uh, our project, uh, how we was dealing with this uh, during the last uh, three years. Thank you. This one? Yeah. Oh. Yes, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the second PDF in Chimo Sunday. On the open of chess project, the expert team and uh, the participants of the seminar. I'm uh, very honored actually to welcome you uh, at the second seminar dedicated for uh, our project Infinite Chess, or uh, in other words, that the project that is dedicated for using chess for involvement of uh, kids, particularly kids uh, with autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, so, my part, I believe we put it together for. And it implements a very important social initiative around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I want to say that this project really matters because this project is about kids, it's about them. Thank you very much. Yes, we have a little time for questions. Is there any question for Anastasia? Then let's take questions for all the speakers and please address, uh, say uh, to whom you address the question. I, I was wondering why infinite? Why did you call it infinite chess? Okay, because you can see the symbol. Yeah, the symbol, yeah. but, but yeah, why so did you choose the symbol? Because the, 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 the autism, it's like infinite, you know, like there is no borders, you know. That's, Prolong forever, so we believe that we can we can do it in a way. Okay. Okay. Um, I have another question to um to Mikkel. Uh, yes. When when you do this um, special needs education, uh, you, this seems to be a strategic decision of uh, Dan Skoluskak or is this a need that comes from the schools? Can you do help us with this? Because in the originally uh, chess um, was not for a certain group 
in, in, in schools, I guess, uh, or a certain group of, of, of students. How did it, how did this come that special needs is so important for, for the school scout to be active and find solutions there? Well, I think over time we've just realized that the potential of, of uh, scholastic chess in special needs education is just vast and probably larger than we ever realized. And we've done some earlier uh, interventions that had such promising results that we asked some foundations and endowments, could you help us explore this further? If we do more of this. And, uh, we found uh, the Obusk uh, Family Fund, the, the Obusk Family Foundation, and they backed uh, the Brain on the cu Curriculum as the next step for us. Um, obviously, also, there is more funding to be had in the area of special needs education than than uh, than elsewhere. So that's part of why we what why we did it. But but basically it, uh, it corresponds with our mission to help those who need it the most. Um any comments or questions from anyone? Please have two comments. Or one yeah. I I had a how you call it, what we do education for teachers. And a teacher came 600 kilometers and he was from a school for kids who were thrown out of schools. A real tough guy. It's mostly boys. And he was a doctor and he was very interesting. And he said, the boys like to behave in the wood. It's in the forest. They behave very good. And when playing chess, that he says chess is like a therapy for the boys. And what's maybe what's interesting for everyone, we had the German school chess conference and we had as a guest Jano Schäffen. Jano is 19 year old and he has EQ 58. And he was in a special school and he can't, he wasn't able to read was every day they called the mother they wanted to throw him out of school and the teacher started chess and he was fascinated he start he wanted to learn to read because he wanted to read chess books and now he's 19 he's got elo about 2000 and he beats he has beaten professors <laughs> and that's and he was acu world champion that's not so important, but he's working as a funeral gardener. He works, he earns money. And this was, it was not possible with his situa situation. And I think chess can heal. Wonderful, wonderful story. It was also covered in major news media in Germany. Emco's story. Um, because normally the general wisdom is, oh, at that IQ, I mean, that puts you like in, in, in the lowest percent of like like people would be really called stupid or and and uh but he showed much potential because of uh he says chat made him free mm -hmm. any other comments please go ahead yes, i have a question oh, yeah. because you told that uh, um that it um, improved uh less absence in school yeah. that, um when um, when you ask the, the students what do what do what do they say the teachers of course but the students why 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 does it help them to come to school most of the knowledge the research is acquired they acquired the speakers who have been told by the students yeah. so it's, it's second hand in that way although they do talk to some of the kids but but the stories are Quite a few of those kids go to school, maybe only three or four days a week, and that's sort of an agreement they have with the school. That's that's their capability. They choose to come to school on the exact day when there is school activities. They won't, they will not miss out on that exact day, and that tells us that uh, we have a tool here which can help. It, it won't solve the entire problem. It's not like it's not a kind of thing. It's not. Yeah. Uh, rip the, the, the sword out of the stone, but it, it's a tool that can help in that respect. It, it seems pretty clear to me. I, I hope that was it. Yes, and uh, the other question is, uh, is also that uh, the classroom atmosphere, you'll say that it's uh, it helps. Is it only when they play chess, or is it also when, uh, when they're not playing chess? It's 
It's <laughs> deliberate connections. You know, we talked about the other day when the teachers pay attention to making the transfer from the chess lessons to other lessons, to the commissions, and indeed to, to the life outside school. The potential is that you can actually make that happen. You need to pay attention to it. And, and what I said really applies to teachers are the heroes of the story. They make it happen. It's not necessarily the game in, in itself. The teacher is a central ingredient. But so is the culture regarding the game of chess. Uh, saying hello to each other before and after the game, waiting for the other to say thing, trying to immerse yourself in problem solving. That type of culture isn't conducive to, to, to creating that atmosphere as well, obviously. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, and because as I've seen, well, we have some children with autism as well, but they are on the left lower spectrum. They go to another right. school together with all the other students. And um, and uh, it's just when I, when I looked at it, I have not made any research, but I, but I see that, uh, that what I say, they, they can concentrate or share something that happened with the brain, then they can sit and concentrate. I have not seen anything else that makes them sit um, half an hour concentrated. <laughs> they cannot listen, they are, they are really very quiet. And, um, and they go from there, it's not otherwise if you get the children quiet. And afterwards, they have so much energy, they just do what? But it does not happen with chess. They concentrate, they play, and then afterwards, they are still calm. So it's, I think you can get it as other things as well. But something with chess is doing this. Uh, and this is just very subjective uh, things, I think. I have also. We find that as well, and having chess ready at its emissions. Uh, they come back calm and quiet, and they're ready to learn. Yeah. And I really, because I think it, it takes so much of my brain to play chess. But they get energy out of it. Stefan, a question for Anastasia. Um, I have a, a high functioning autistic child join my chess club. I'm sorry, I can't see you. Yes, you did. Okay. And um, I found that during the class session, with, with other children, he would develop a sense of panic if he was about to lose his queen or and, and became very disruptive and almost abusive in class. So I had to actually ask him to come half an hour earlier and do a one-to-one -one session with him and gradually motivate him to play chess in a much calmer way before he could join the rest of the class. In, in your experience, uh, do autistic children respond better to one-to-one? -to -one? Uh, it really depends, you know, it's, it's very, as I say, it's, it's, it's in uh, each case, it's very different, you know, some kids with autism spectrum disorder, for them it's already a big problem, they, they learn how the name of the pieces and how they move, even from some to just the name of the pieces, some of them could <laughs> compete, some of them maybe in like in your case, you know, they cannot compete with other kids, so it's very much individual. Uh, that's why when we uh, launch our program, we recommend that except chess teacher, uh, uh, you have a tutor who is working with kids with autism spectrum disorder to help with this. But um, a lot of answers you can find in our guidelines that we can uh, download. Or if you have any other questions, we have specialists uh, whom you can address this question and we will be happy to help in particular cases. Thank you. Thank you. I have maybe a final question to uh, Beatrice. Um, you you uh, speak about creativity, and um, I was just reflecting a little bit on what what we usually teach when we teach chess to kids. Um, we are not teaching them to take risks. Usually, the way to be successful in in the, in the early stages in chess is not to take risks. It's to capture material, make some easy threads, but if they are if they are parried. Not to go further, and um, and also we show them puzzles made in one move or find the capture. That is not not necessarily going into the direction of uh, promoting creativity. Mm -hmm. Do you think there could be a different curriculum for especially from uh, using chess or maybe also more games for promoting creativity? I think we have to reflect when we we. Because there are different um, goals in this kind of practice, so it depends on what we have we want to develop. Taking risks, it, it, it means also trying on an opening, 
So, um, often uh, children would try other openings, but sometimes it depends on the teacher, you know. So, in, in, we have to reflect on how to, yeah, how to nourish this, uh, this creativity and how, yeah. Mm, so, you so it, it, it depends on the, uh, what I would say that when you propose something, you have to always to think, is something that block the, uh, the creativity or something that you open? Other, so, for example, it's, it's okay to ask one, 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 math, uh, one mate in one move, you know? so it's okay, but, but you, you, we can also explore other, other ways. So, yeah. But also in math, you know, in math, it's, uh, we have the same problem. We would the right answer. This is the right answer culture that we should uh, think about. Please go ahead. Right. Yeah, um, just, just from listening, I don't know what uh, sort of creativity you're talking about because I actually can't wait. Um, but when I started uh, learning chess, which was not uh, so long ago, um, when I started doing the puzzles, what I started doing is instead of solving a puzzle, I uh, came up with some puzzles. So I gave myself a homework every day to say, find three major moves, or when I'm learning the pin, um, find a find a pin, and then I, I I give the basic structures, and then my idea was to just add pieces to understand where do the pieces have to go to um, either you know that it still works or that it doesn't work. So maybe I don't know if that's like some sort of greater way of yeah. Um, but um, it's, it's just what I'm sort of like, answering. To, yeah, I mean answering uh, also to the a specific curriculum that we need uh, for that. I think that we need to to train teachers about creative learning. Yes, for sure. So it's it's uh, important to to it's what I do also. In math, in science, and other uh, other features, uh, we have to to and there is a book that Mitchell Resnick wrote is uh, the father of uh, Scratch that we saw yesterday. Uh, it's uh, lifelong to the garden, cultivating the the um, creativity with the four piece, and this is a, it's a it's a um, very um, uh, interesting book because it's short but it's so deep. And I think it could help out this answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, we are having two more exciting sessions in the afternoon today. Uh, at one o'clock, a session on national uh, chess projects, chess and school projects. And um, after that, a uh, uh, sorry, a uh, session on uh, chess research, some current uh, research uh, presentations. Uh, and um, now we have the lunch break and it's a good opportunity to interact and connect with each other and continue the conversation. One question, is someone going at four o'clock with a taxi to the airport? Heathrow? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.